Hello and welcome everyone. In this video, I'm going to take a single stage space plane to curve in orbit, land it back at the Kerbal Space Center, and then repeat that as many times as possible without refueling. Achieving a high mass per engine was crucial for optimizing this mission, so we pushed the mass of the craft to 428 tons for a mass of 61 tons per whiplash engine. The plane is only gonna get lighter from here over the course of the mission, which makes this first ascent to orbit the most challenging. For that reason, on this first ascent, I'm gonna focus on the ascent profile. And then after that, we're gonna go back and look more at the design of the craft. The first order of business is to pick up as much speed as possible on the runway. We're gonna to get to about 157 meters per second before taking off. This still is not enough speed for the wings to generate enough lift to climb efficiently. So we're gonna stay right at sea level and maintain that elevation until we push through transonic speeds and reach Mach 1. After going past transonic speeds, the aerodynamics of the craft become more efficient and we can start climbing. Soon after this point, I'm going to drop the nose into an even more shallow ascent, giving me more time to reach a higher speed on the air breathing engines. After 19 minutes of flying, we reach an altitude of 14.5 kilometers and a speed of 1,320 meters per second. At this point, the air breathing engines are losing most of their thrust, so we're firing up the nuclear engine and leaving on the air breathing engine for what remaining thrust that they have. The goal here remains to stay at a shallow ascent and pick up speed before gaining altitude until we have enough speed where the combination of wing lift and centripetal acceleration starts to overcome gravity. At an airspeed of 1700 meters per second, the plane starts to climb naturally and we start heading towards space. The nuclear engine is left on for about 17 minutes until we've reached a speed of 2200 meters per second at an altitude of 36 kilometers. At this point, we are in a suborbital trajectory, so we're going to let the plane coast the rest of the way to space. After turning off the nuclear engine, it takes about nine more minutes to reach an altitude of 70 kilometers where we are in space and do a, another small burn to reach a circular low carbon orbit. We have no destination past low carbon orbit, so it's time to land this and then we can repeat the ascent to orbit again. The space plane has the majority of its fuel remaining, meaning that it is still quite massive and takes a long time to slow down on its descent back to the surface. However, since it's been optimized just to head to orbit and back, it is still very stable aerodynamically and easy to control. The challenging part of the landing is the final approach. Due to the mass of the plane, the stall speed is quite high and correspondingly our landing airspeed needs to be quite high. We also still need most of the runway to take off again. I wanted to maintain the purity of this mission by not using anything to push it around on the runway once it landed there. So we're gonna to try to land as soon as we can on the runway, slow down as fast as possible, and have as much of it as possible then to take off again. Finally, due to the high mass of the plane, the vertical speed on touchdown needed to be very small in order to not destroy the landing gear. That landing means that one lap of the Kerbal Space Center to low curb and orbit and back is complete. We're now gonna complete that lap as many times as possible. Due to the changing mass of the craft, there's going to be a continuous shift in what the ascent profile and the descent profile look like on each of these subsequent laps. I'm going to let that be seen in the video, and I'm going to focus now on the design of the plane itself. One of the first design compromises that we can see results in the small unpowered rollout on the runway, followed by a slow throttling up of the engines. This is due to the low amount of intake air with only one shock cone intake feeding seven engines. The critical bottleneck for intake air occurs at around zero to 30 meters per second. After this point, one intake is enough to feed many engines and I could have pushed it to nine engines if I really wanted to. Next thing to look at here is overcoming gravity by generating aerodynamic lift. To keep this plane efficient, there is an angle of incidence on the wing where the wing is rotated up relative to the body of the craft, which means that we can have the nose pointed directly prograde while still generating lift from the wings. All real planes also have an angle of incidence. The angle of incidence on these wings is about five degrees, which is a lot, especially at low al altitude. This high angle of incidence does mean though that we can have smaller wings 
which really pays off when it gets to the aerodynamics at high altitude, and it also slightly decreases our dry mass, which is very important in a mission like this. The position of the wings along the length of the plane is also very important, and there's a design trade-off here. Positioning the wings on the plane controls where our center of lift is relative to the center of mass of the plane. The closer the center of lift is to the center of mass, the more efficiently the plane flies. But as it gets closer to the center of mass, we start to have issues with stability. So there's a balance here of keeping the center of lift enough behind the center of mass that we have good stability while not putting it too far behind such that the nose would want to naturally fall down and we'd have to be fighting to keep it up. This careful balance results in further difficulty when fuel starts draining. We've put the center of mass in a very specific spot and we don't want that to move as fuel drains. This means that we want the center of wet mass with fuel and the center of dry mass without fuel to be in the same place. The most natural way to put a space plane together would have been to put all the engines at the back. This however would concentrate dry mass at the rear of the plane making our center of mass shift backwards as fuel is drained. This is why the air breathing engines are near the front of the plane. They balance out the nuclear engine at the back and leave our center of mass in the same place throughout the mission. The first part that this plane was built around was the larger 10 ton nuclear engine. The only disadvantage of this engine is its size. We can't have half of an engine, so this engine determined the overall mass of the craft, which then determined how many of the air breathing engines I used, and how many wings I used, and every other part. Seven of the whiplash air breathing engines to one of the nuclear engines turned out to be the ideal ratio here. As I mentioned earlier, the one shock cone intake would have allowed for more engines, but more than seven was just too much. The choice of the whiplash engine is something to take note of here. The performance of the whiplash engine and the performance of the rapier engine that I didn't use here remains the same from KSP-1. In KSP-1 there were almost no situations where you would use the whiplash engine over the rapier engine. Certainly in a mission such as this one, one would have used the rapier engine in KSP-1. The significant difference in KSP-2 is the improved performance of the nuclear engine. Now that that is more efficient, the performance in the closed cycle part of the ascent is better, which diminishes the significance of doing as much of the ascent as possible with the air breathing engines. This makes the higher specific impulse of the whiplash engine relative to the rapier engine more important, making it a better choice than the rapier engine for this mission in KSP-2. That covers the key design parts of the space plane, so it's now time to look at some of the unusual quirks and features of this. The methane fuel tanks feeding the air breathing engines are smaller tanks packed into the fairing at the front rather than some of the larger MK3 fuel tanks available. While in KSP-2 all fuel tanks have the same dry to wet mass ratio, I did notice a high amount of body drag with the MK3 parts, which meant that it was worth having slightly more mass with a larger fairing in order to have lower body drag. On the other hand, the large hydrogen fuel tanks, which have exposed structural elements that seem like they should generate a ton of drag, are surprisingly slippery. I spent some time looking over landing gear for this mission. Landing gear is dry mass, which is very important to reduce. I wanted to go with the lightest landing gear possible that still wouldn't break when we touched down. While we don't need to rotate on taking off here, keeping the rear landing gear as far forward as possible was still very useful here to prevent the front landing gear from slamming down harder than necessary. The landing gear is designed to keep the nose of the craft low when we're on the ground. This prevents the wing from generating lift and drag that we don't need when we're on the runway and helped us reach a higher speed when still on the runway, which was particularly important in the first takeoff. I was surprised by how much of a difference this made. It accounted for about 10 meters per second of extra speed on the runway on that first takeoff. Let's look at the control surfaces on this plane. The only large control surfaces are for pitch because this is the one axis of control that directly affects the main metric of performance. 
we do also need to be able to control roll and yaw, and we do have small control surfaces for each of those, but that correction can afford to be slow. The small amount of yaw and roll control does make landings more difficult, but this isn't an acrobatic aircraft. We have plenty of time to line up the landings. For attitude control in space, we do have one very small set of reaction wheels and a small solar panel at the back. Again, this did not need to be a large amount of control. Maneuverability was not a key point. We are now on our ninth ascent from the Kerbal Space Center. As the fuel has drained and the craft has gotten lighter, we have continually shifted towards a much steeper ascent profile. We have a lot more wing than we need now, so getting out of the thicker atmosphere gives us better efficiency. We've also started igniting the nuclear engine at a lower airspeed with each ascent. This was part planned and part a result of being surprised by how much the efficiency of the closed cycle part of the ascent was improving with each launch. I wanted to make sure that I was using the hydrogen fuel as fast as I was using the methane fuel, so igniting the nuclear engine at a lower airspeed helped keep these fuel levels balanced. The upcoming landing would now be the ninth of the mission, so I now had plenty of practice doing this, and with the mass of the plane now being lighter than it had been at any other point in the mission, the landing was getting downright easy. We aren't really big fans of doing things the easy way on this channel, so I considered some other options to throw a little bit of sauce on this one. This unofficial helicopter has now flown from the Kerbal Space Center to low Kerbin orbit and landed back on Kerbin a sequence of nine times. My favorite part of this mission was looking at the sequence of fuel used for each ascent. It decreases faster than a decreasing geometric sequence. Not only is the mass of the craft decreasing, but the efficiency is also improving due to the higher thrust to weight ratio in each ascent. I will put the sequence of mass on runway over each return to the Kerbal Space Center in the video description for anyone who wants to look over that. This was also a really fun mission from a flight point of view. Taking off and landing in atmosphere is always one of the most fun things to fly, and I had plenty of opportunity in this mission to get practice doing that with the same plane, and I could feel myself getting better at it as the mission went on. So then, we end this video talking about practice. Thank you again to my supporters on Patreon. Thank you everyone very much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you in the next one.